Uh, welcome everybody to another edition of Dostoevsky's Demons or Possessed or Besi in original Russian. Uh, we are getting to the juicy parts now, the murders, the violence, uh, all the theoretical underpinnings that we've been discussing thus far are now being transformed into actual demise of, of individuals and this little town, which is a microcosm for a Russian society at the time. So I'm really curious uh, where our discussion is going to lead to today. Uh, we have really quite um, quite a few interesting uh, options to, to discuss. I'm going to just mention some highlights and, um, you know, see where where you guys want to take it. Um, very curious what, what we're going to focus on. So uh, obviously the first couple of chapters deal with this uh, event, uh, this festivity that has been looming before us. And this uh, turns out to be kind of the anticlimactic um, uh, sequence of events that leads to the actual, um, the fires, the murders, uh, the love affair uh, between uh, uh, Elizabeth and uh, Stavrogin, and of course, uh, the deaths of uh, Libatkin and his sister, Stavrogin's wife. Uh, then we have the death of Petka, who is, in fact, their murderer. Uh, so we have quite, uh, you know, basically uh, four characters that are already taken off the stage by the time we're done with this little section, and there's going to be more to follow, as you could probably imagine. Uh, we have some very notable um, philosophical discussions that are taking place, both underpinning the uh, performance of uh, Karmazin, the, uh, the writer who, is, uh, who Dostoevsky uses as a, a point of satire against Turgenev, and also um, uh, Stepan Trofimovich Verkhovensky himself, who makes this uh, appeal appeal for beauty and how beauty is more important than material things. And I'm very curious about uh, what you uh, what you have to say about that. And maybe we'll maybe we'll even read a couple of passages uh, around that because I think they're short enough and interesting enough to, to uh, uh, give them some airtime. And then, then of course, we have this uh, very perhaps unexpected uh, uh, turn of events where uh, Elizabeth runs off to Stavrogin and then leaves him, spends a night uh, at his place, um, a night of passion, I guess, uh, from what it sounds like. And then uh, she leaves him and she makes some very interesting observations about her life and her sort of philosophy and maybe you know you guys have some thoughts on on that. Is she a nihilist like uh, like Kirillov? Is she really different than Kirillov, who wants to just kill himself and uh, make that sort of his ultimate act? And in some ways, maybe Elizabeth is not that far off from him. So that's another uh, obviously very interesting character uh, that we could we could explore and talk about. And then finally, this whole idea of of uh, of Putting together the you know the anger, the pent up anger, the cynicism that's brewing in society, and it's it's um, lashing out against these um, wealthy people who are seen as oppressors, and you know the tragic death of Elizabeth is part of that, and then of course the death of um, Lubatkin um, and and uh, his sister um, Maria Timofeevna. All of that is uh, again the background to this uh, movement, this conspiracy, if you will, uh, that is stirred by by Verkhovensky's son, Peter. And uh, what, again, we, we keep coming back to this. What, what are his real motives? What, what, are, what are his aims? What, what is he doing in all of this? So these are just some of the um, directions that we can take in this uh, tonight in, in discussing this. I, I wanna open it up to first to CJ uh, and then Doug. And uh, after that, I'm going to open it up to you. If you have read uh, um, you've read uh, this section and want to share something, then we'll, we'll open it up to everybody. Uh, and, and if 
we might we might break into maybe a couple of uh, uh, breakout rooms. It looks like we have enough people to maybe do two rooms, so we can talk in a little more kind of an intimate setting. Um, but uh, CJ, go ahead if you have some some observations and thoughts you want to share with us. Yeah, my observations. You know, even though I'm fairly philosophically minded, I didn't really get into the philosophy as you mentioned. Um, as I was reviewing it this this afternoon, I said, you know, I should reread that Liza passage and, um, you know, Berkovinsky's speech to try to figure out what the other subtext were. But for me, the first chapter, the festivities begin, the first chapter, part three, I mean, um, I was um, impressed by how Gavarov, our narrator, depicts the whole scene as scandalous. But for, for me reading it, it was hilarious. Um, well, yeah, chapter one was. Um, there were a bunch of pranks, and there was the boring, rambling merci of Karmazinov, <laughs> and there were hecklers, and the hecklers engaged Stepan Verkovinsky, and I found the account utterly hilarious. Um, but I, I didn't, I didn't feel the scandal which Gavarov is telling us is there. So I guess I'm just not tuned into elite um, culture where such pranks and heckling might be interpreted as a front to social hierarchies. Um, maybe that's what I'm missing. I'm not sure what I'm missing. And, and I was a little distracted by the very slight low level of sexism and prejudice that seeped into the text from time to time. Uh, then, then in chapter two, the end of the festivities, this wasn't funny, as Jeannie um, commented. I think we both agreed. It was very sad. Um, you know, the way the ball just falls flat, people don't show up. Um, was that a scandal? It didn't appear to be a scandal to me, but Gavarov depicts it as a scandal. Um, and then the tragic ending, as you mentioned, with Lebyatkin, his sister Maria, and their maid. Don't forget the maid. There were lots of murders. <laughs> um, um, Maria, as you mentioned, is Nikolai Stavrogin's wife. And we also have the arson of part of the town. We, we later learn that Fedka committed the murders on Peter Verkovinsky's order, but the arson uh, that Fedka did was quickly put out, and the arson that actually burnt down part of the town must have been set by others, and there's a strange passage where the wheels of justice are parodied a little um, about that. Uh, chapter three, the end of the romance. The romance is between Liza and Nikolai. And that you're, you're right. I would really love to understand what that dialogue and discussion was about. I didn't, I, I, I don't know. I was distracted or something. I didn't read it twice. I needed to. Um, I, I did notice that instead of my usual approach of reading very literally, I noticed the um, narrator goes out of his way to indicate that Liza has to button up her dress. Well, the alternative theory is that they just spent the night talking together, but if they spent the night talking together, she probably wouldn't have had to button up her dress. Um, so I, I decided to break my literal reading and say, ah, they must have, you know, needed to take off their clothes for some reason. But then I realized, how could Gavarov, the narrator, have known that she needed to put that item of clothing buttoned back up? And, and I realized Stavrogin might not have even noticed that. 
Um, did how did Gavarov? They, again, I get into my narrator um, skepticism. Uh, how could the narrator have known? Is the narrator reading into this stuff and providing evidence for the version of the story that he believes, even though the alternative story might have happened? Who knows? Anyway, um, uh, it was it was definitely the end of a romance, death by mob trampling. Um, <laughs> The fourth chapter, the final decision, we have Peter's plot to use the five to kill Shatov. And what struck me there was how everyone rebels against Peter's scheming. Fedka finally develops a character and, and gives some real meaningful moralistic passages where you want to uh, think of him as maybe not the violent criminal he is. And he punches Peter. <laughs> Yay, Fedka. <laughs> and and Lip, Liputin nearly deserts the plan, but in the end, for reasons that, unfortunately for me, suggest that maybe the novel's going this way, that even when you have the presence of mind to realize you should desert the plan and escape and leave with your secret luggage and all that, you end up going to the meeting anyway. <laughs> and and that, that, that's my impression of what's going to happen is that Dostoevsky is just going to take us through a, I haven't read the ending, my guess is, um, that people are going to dare to to be heroic and then just fall in line and execute this very poorly planned um filled with lies scheme of peter um uh kirillov almost sees through peter's scheme and it left me wondering, is he really going to kill himself just so that Peter can kill Shatov for no redeeming social value? Um, or is Kirillov going to rise to the occasion and say, yes, I want to kill myself, but not for this. <laughs> and the, <Suspense>. the chapter <laughs> ends with, with great suspense. Will the five manage to assassinate Shatov and pin the deed on Kirillov's suicide? We can speculate, but we'll find out soon enough. Uh, all right, thank you, thanks, CJ. Uh, Doug, what about you? What are your thoughts uh, and impressions? Well, there, there's, there's one thing I wanted to talk about, which is uh, the festivities. Um, and the stage of the festivities. And uh, what CJ said um, uh, in another conversation uh, of wanting novels to have different choices. Well, the thing about the festivities is the crowd takes it over. It's like the groundlings in Shakespearean theater take over the stage. And anyone can do that. It's amazing that theater exists generally with some people wanting audience interaction up to a point, but not too much. And some there, there, there's sort of these unstated and unstated rules of what's proper. We had to train teachers not to stifle the responses of their students to theater because, you know, that's what it's about. And Frank Vatican actually said, a theater, is, the only moral purpose of a theater, not only but the main moral purpose of a theater is to find out other people respond to things differently than you do. So you may be crying about something, but some next to you is laughing about it, or you're howling with laughter and real turn to the person next to you and there are tears coming down their face or something. And so I think that's what's scary about trying to bring theater back when people are wearing masks and you can't really see. I've always thought theater was about the reaction of the audience and not, not what's going on on stage. That's a trigger to see how the audience responds. But, and the, the response is radical. And it reminds me of theater galas too, 
and some that integrate everybody into one party and some that have a real pretty ironclad class system where some people are simply not allowed in the room. And a few might sneak in and they might try to disrupt it or they might try to sing, sing an obscene song like the drunk does or a poem or something. And, you know, that happens too in theater and galas. And then there are other galas it's very interesting, the parties where if you introduce the tech people and the low-end employees of a theater to a board member, they'd often buy them drinks. So people want to kind of connect across class lines, but there are a lot of reasons we don't, and that doesn't happen. But theater, I think it's why theater's always been seen as a health hazard and a moral threat. And the fact that it's been closed down for a combination of both, that's what happened to the Elizabethan theater because people get into a room and they're stimulated by the action of a play and you don't really know what's going to happen. Apparently Queen Elizabeth would give her reviews to an actor while they were performing and tell them they were a terrible actor. I mean, the queen would actually, that's why the, all the noble characters in Midsummer Night's Dream are chattering. So I, I really like the theatrical free for all of this stage and who's going to control the action of the world, so to speak. And, you know, and that people should pay respect because I'm thanking you for your readership, but they don't. And, uh, and then uh, Pan has his own lecture on beauty, which they don't do. And Peter, uh, there's somebody, but Peter set him up clearly to attack him for Fedka, but then Fedka attacks Peter. So it's really interesting. I mean, the intricacy of the plot and the, and the forces is really fascinating to me. Uh, and the narrator actually, who is pretty coy and invisible through most of the novel, actually after the kind of, it's almost like a limerick or something dirty about, you know, uh, Madame Lemke. And, and uh, he runs backstage and he attacks Laputin for setting this up. That's the most active thing he's done in the novel. And then within a page, he disappears again. He just says, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. And, I can always put my sash in my pocket and run away. So the narrator is really part of the story, but he's not really. I don't think he can be trusted at all to be telling the truth about anything. Um, yeah, I think this thing, that's, a, that's a very interesting. I mean, I know you, you, CJ has noticed that the narrator kind of has this godlike quality of knowing things that he could not have possibly known. Uh, and at the same time, he is appearing and reappearing in different places to create this illusion that actually he could have surmised all this information by interviewing this, you know, this person or that person. And so it, cre it creates some level of um, credulity to the fact, to the possibility that he actually interviewed people at the time or after the fact and teased out all these different nuances. But of course, we know that it probably, that's not how it really works in life. You can't really go back and, 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 and imagine or, or uh, figure out that uh, Elizabeth was standing and buttoning her, her dress or whatever. I mean, those kinds of details are probably lost uh, in, a, in a real life scenario. The only other thing I'd throw out is that Liza or Lizette or Elizabeth were mm -hmm. called different things. It seems she's horrified at the murders and they might've been done for her sake or for him to be free to be with her. And then she goes to investigate it and that, or just see it or witness it. And that's what mm -hmm. gets her killed. That's a very interesting beat where there's some action and reaction and counteraction and mm -hmm. resultant, mm -hmm. you know, as Bucky would say, action, reaction, resultant. I mean, there's a real sequence of startling kind of uh, bouncing off the walls sort of for sure. story for sure. so that's I, all. I want to thank you Doug uh, I want to uh, just <clears throat> very quickly point out <clears throat> again I don't know if it's clear if it comes off clear to you but to me you know having read this several times I just see a completely uh, obvious connection between everything that has happened from the very first moments that Stavrogin came to town to where we are now uh, including his very first action of infamy of, you know, uh, pulling the guy by his nose and doing all these other things and um, that are com completely subversive to what's, a, what's considered acceptable in society, subversive to the existing uh, respectability of people that are supposed to be respected. 
uh, the events of putting pornography in together with the Bible, you know, all these things, putting a mouse in the uh, icon. And then finally, the final act of, of bringing basically this entire um, small town or the best people, the most notable people in town, including, but also including what Dostoevsky calls scum or trashy. I, I don't know how it's translated in different, different translations, but in one translation I read, it was, you know, it's the scum, the, the trash. He calls them trashy people that have been let in together with, uh, I guess, the, what he considers like normal people in town. And then publicly, there is this disrespect and, and scandalizing of an event that is supposed to symbolize culture, refinement, progressive ideals, you know, all these things. And, it is, and yet what we see happening is actually the opposite. It's, it's, it's making fun and uh, making fun of everything, both the old and the new, you know, the, the conservative ideals and the, the revolutionary ideals, to, you know, uh, essentially um, profaning both, both of these directions. And if you go back to the speech that Verkhavensky, Pyotr Verkhavensky was having with Stavrogin, what he was talking about is the fact that what's important is to uh, profane everything and, and to uh, get everybody like drunk with, with vice and, and dishonor. And that's the, that's the attractive part is the fact that almost like in church where you, you're absolved from your sins in this revolutionary moment, everybody is absolved from everything and you can do anything. And there's apparently in his mind, some very attractive quality to this, to this disorder and chaos especially when you're coming out of an orderly and chaotic society. Uh, and I'm thinking of maybe like, you know, if you want to make a parallel to your own, uh, to American culture, you know, think of the, the 50s and the very traditional established order. And then the appeal of the 60s and the, the, the hippies and all, all, all the, everyone who basically said, I mean, they, were, they didn't go as far as the, what Dostoevsky describes. And, and in fact, they weren't about dishonor at all. They were probably very honorable in their, in their, but what happens is these ideals in, in, in inevitably get mired in human frailty and vice, unfortunately. And that's what the I think, is so, so masterful in, in, um, in depicting. Okay, we have quite a few people that want to join the discussion. If you guys don't mind, could you uh, uh, use uh, type an exclamation point in chat? That way I can kind of see who, who wanted to speak first, and that way we can we can do it in order. Because if you raise your hands, I can't tell who, who, who did it first. Yeah. Uh, Madeline, uh, go ahead. And then Allison, and then uh, whoever else wants to join. Go ahead, um, Madeline. OK. Um, let's see. Well, I think uh, with the FET, uh, you know, she had put on the whole thing. And it would, I mean, it really was the equivalent of like people just coming in from the street and trashing your home. And the irony of it is that she had invited them all sort of as a, I'm not sure if she would have been familiar with democratization, but at least of some sort of egalitarian feeling that everyone could participate in this. Everyone was welcome. You know, she lowered the ticket prices. She made it possible for everyone to come. And then they trashed her place. And at the end, and it seemed like, uh, remember when those conspirators were talking and the man was saying, what we need to do is get rid of culture and intellectuals and just bring everyone down to the very lowest level. Mm -hmm. That seems to be what's happened by the end of this party. And uh, I also wanted to address, um, CJ is, seems quite perturbed uh, by the fluctuating narrative perspective um, I don't know if anyone here has read Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantle, which, okay, that's a book that is mostly in the third person, and you'll be reading along, it, it follows the life of Cromwell, it's an historical novel, you'll be reading along, and all of a sudden you'll, you'll just realize that you're, that you've, she somehow slipped into a first person narrative from Cromwell's perspective, and it's so interesting to go back and see how she even got there. So she has a very interesting, I'll call it the authorial voice. Dostoevsky, um, 
I don't think that he intended to write it as a first person novel and kept sort of screwing up on continuity and how could this guy have known this. He could easily have made the choice to either leave those things out entirely or say, I got it, I heard it from so and so who was spying in the window sort of thing. Uh, or he could have written the whole thing in the third person and it would have been just as credible. So the question is kind of, why didn't he write the whole thing in the third person omniscient? Mm -hmm. Why did he even bring in a first person narrator? Uh, to me, it seems like to give us the feeling of like, you are here. You know, this is, this is what's happening. Welcome to our small town. I'm your tour guide. But he just inserts that occasionally. And uh, I think that if it's, it didn't bother me at all. Um, in fact, I barely noticed it. Uh, because it didn't, um, none of the facts contradicted each other. And the first person narrator does say, I'm going to tell you events as they happened and as I learned them, even though now I know differently, blah, blah, blah. So I don't think he's, he's an unreliable narrator, but he's narrating things as they unfolded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great, uh, uh, Madeline, that's a great point about how, how it could have been done. And also what you mentioned about the reasons why he did it. I, I actually totally agree with this immediacy aspect that we get this immediacy, the sense that we are there with him or observing things. I wanna just uh, uh, say one thing and then we'll go to Allison and Maritza. Uh, don't forget that Dostoevsky suffered from mental illness as well throughout his life. Uh, he had bouts with, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, uh, like seizures. And, and uh, things like that. And, and, and this idea of going back and forth between sort of like normal and surreal is I think very close to his consciousness. And so sometimes, you know how, how you, you get a sense of why things are happening without really like really understanding the factual basis of it. And so that novel, because it's, it jumps around like CG mentioned, and it, you, you go back and forth between the narrator and then also just like this anonymous third person account. Um, it creates this sense of shifting consciousness, which I think people with, again, I don't know, since I'm, <laughs> I don't have the, the autism or mental disease yet, but I, I have a feeling that people that do have struggle with um, perception of reality, I think that's how it would, it would, it would appear perhaps to them. Uh, so maybe that's another reason why Dostoevsky chose to include a narrator and yet he's inconsistent, inconsistently present in, in the narration. Uh, okay, Allison and then Maritza. Um, one thing that I think he's so genius at in this book is he knows just the right moment when to switch between, you know, it's like sometimes it's like these very, very serious topics. And then it's like at this fever pitch to the point where it's uncomfortable. And then he just like shies away from that and then goes into full throttle comedy. And then just when you're starting to get sort of bored, like, okay, what is the point of it's funny, but what's the point of this? And then she throws in a zinger and, and it's, it's brilliant. I mean, it's like, like sweet and sour, you know, like playing with these two opposites. Um, and I think it's wonderful. And then the other thing that I thought was just hilarious was the, the running joke about the buffet, because he would like say it and then he would leave it alone for 30 pages and then back with the buffet. And I just had this image of all these people on a cruise ship, like running around frantically screaming, where's the buffet? And, um, but I feel like the whole point that was in there really was because he's showing the hypocrisy of wealthy elites who want to side with like the common people and the man, but really they don't want to be around them at all. So it's like a limousine liberal, you know, or uh, latte Democrats, you know, like there, there is, there's very class structure is, is always a part of life. And so he's kind of playing with that and showing that um and that that was really uh those are the two of the things that really struck me um in this and and then the other thing that i thought was funny actually was that that um nikolai was just like in shock that um this one was elizabeth that she just had her fun with him and was done and he couldn't believe it and he's a man who you know he does this with everybody and murders along the way yet a woman does it to him and he cannot handle it 
But meanwhile, how many women did he do this to? And he murdered one, at least one now, more than one. You know, so he's not just playing with their feelings. He kills them too. And yet he's just like appalled, like, oh my gosh, what? Um, and she said something about that too. That it's only your ego that bothers you. That's what's bothering you is your ego in right. this situation. I, I've, I also found interesting the, the connection between that um, funny, um, scandalous poem about a governess yeah. and who is a governess who is, a, um, I guess, a, a disciple of George Sand and Elizabeth's behavior, because Elizabeth and her sort of this enjoyment of the moment is exactly what George Sand was popularizing. And in fact, you know, George Sand's if you uh, know about, a little bit about her biography, she, she, she had like tons of different relationships and marriages and divorces. And she just jumped from one person to another essentially throughout her life and um, trying to kind of epitomize this idea of um, a women's choice and um, basically like women's right to find the right partner and not stay in like an, a single lifelong unhappy marriage and things like that. And, and Elizabeth, in some ways, is very much putting that into practice, but of course, maybe with uh, unexpected results for, for herself, for Stavrogin. I, I guess we can talk about that as well. Well, the other one that was hilarious was they were saying, oh, well, i sure she, she just she just can't wait to get married. And then they say, oh, what's a few corpses? She won't mind because she wants to get to the altar. You know, a woman will overlook a few corpses. I mean, it was so <laughs> funny. <laughs> and then they said, but she'll bring up those corpses. She always brings up the man's past just in the second year of marriage. And you know, they kept saying over again, the few corpses, just a few corpses. I mean, it was hilarious. It really was. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Maritza, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Alison. Um, on the, uh, the topic of the end of the romance, I think the most fascinating thing about that is that is her reason it's not like she had her fun with him and now doesn't want him she tells him that she understands for having that like she now understands due to having been with him that that night that he doesn't love her and i think that's really interesting it's like because she's she's a ruined woman she understands that and when she gave herself to him the night before, she fully intended to run away with him. But she goes into this, um, that weird little thing where she brings up some other guy who some, somebody who overstays their welcome perpetually. She's like, well, I don't wanna be somebody who, you know, stays the whole day when I should only stay half a day. And I just thought that was really interesting because it's the, she sees past the, um, kind of like the charm that most of the people see within um, Stavrogin. And so she, she believed, she, cause she told him, you don't love me. And he's like, she can tell that I don't, but it's fascinating that she sees that. Like, I mean, even having given herself to him, she can make that. And she sees it so starkly that she feels that she has to separate from him. I thought that was really interesting, especially if we remember the times, right? The the action she was taking would like leave her a tarnished woman for the rest of her life. If she ran away with him, then she wouldn't have the stigma because presumably they would get married. She would be considered, you know, uh, redeemed as it were. But another thing about um, Lisa is that I think she's murdered and it's yes, so murder. innuendo and so non-explicitly stated that we're not actually left with certainty. She went to go see the burnt house and the crowd beat her to death, except it never says that they, it says they took her away bloody and bruised. And I'm like, dead? I'm thinking dead. I guess I gotta wait to the end yeah. of the book to see if she ever resurrects. But right. my assumption is they killed her. Yes. Which is, <laughs> so I didn't necessarily read, read the, um, these pages as super deep or heavier on the philosophy, but in um, you know retrospect thinking on it. So the one person who can see through the false charm and false um, edicts of love, 
gets killed by society. Okay, interesting. Um, but you, the, uh, what did you think about the reasons that they gave? Why, why, what, like, uh, did you think it was irrational that they killed her or did you? Absolutely. I mean, there's, you can't, there's, it's impossible to put rationality upon the beating of a woman because you find her to be a fallen woman. I mean, there's, uh, uh, well, even considering their times. I think, I think their anger well, you know, obviously not just they're saying she it. caused it. They're they're saying yeah. they're saying that indirectly she's the reason these people are dead. Um yeah. that's that's not rational. That's pure emotion. That's these are this is more of the chaos that we see in the FET. It's now in real life. It's the yeah. same thing. Just now it doesn't have the uh, parameters of a FET around it. And what happens? Murder. Um, so, so yeah, no, I, I would not put any type of rationality to that at all. Um, well, maybe, maybe, maybe rationality is not the right word. I guess what I meant, um, uh, I guess the immediate, uh, what, what set them off, you know, the trigger. Right. right. And I understand it, it, it is understandable and it's definitely conceivable that that would be the emotional reaction of a crowd in that state, especially considering that she has come in their mind, they think she's coming to God. They don't yeah. understand the emotional state that she's in and her reason for needing to see it, to see them. Um, all they know is they think that she's coming to, to gawk and she's indirectly part of the cause for this. So, I mean, you know, I can understand that. I don't know if it's justified, but um, no, because no, there are but people in this not, book not who've done all. so not much not more. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, so so it's it's kind of crazy. And the... the um, you know, the supposition that it was Stavrogin who had them murdered is like, okay, so why no anger towards him? He's free to walk about. Nobody's bloodying him up to death. Mm -hmm. um, and so she had her two, like I said, to me, it just seemed like so cruel that she she literally had like, you know, two scenes after her um, big uh, moment of um, right. understanding that was deeper than most of the, because, you know, by this point, I've been reading since the beginning of part three, and I find it to be purely insipid, the entire, I mean, the whole fat was just ridiculous. It was, it was amusing and funny, but it was just like, why, why, why are you wasting my time with this crap? Um, and then you get to this, which is, it has more depth, and you see this character in a way you hadn't seen her before, and then they kill her. Um, and it also showed, to me, this was the first time that I was shown Stavrogin in the first person being truly cruel. All the other cruel things about Stavrogin were third hand. And as the reader, I was allowed the potentiality for mm -hmm. most of his demonness to be purely within the eyes of the society but this one was truly pointed out i mean well with the exception obviously of we know that's not because we we got to read at tifkins but this one also in addition to that this was just his because he see he was like yeah she saw through it she saw i didn't love her oh well what am i supposed to do like he was totally unabashed and unremorseful for the fact that he was intending to deceive her Mm -hmm. And he was just like, well, she saw me on to the next thing. He's, you know, it was just, it was almost, that was almost amusing to me, just how he was just like, and you get another vision of how, like, to me, it pointed out, you know, this person really does have an inner core that has some depravity here. We're seeing this because the lack of emotion, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I know that, you know, not necessarily just having spent the night with someone means that you're going to have all these emotions. But in the book, it's we're told that the plan was not just to have the night of fun. They were going to run off together. So right. presumably, well, I I want to uh, let's maybe uh, I, I I see there are a couple of people that want to mention this. Uh, let's maybe read a couple of I, I want to read a couple of passages relating to this because it seems like that's where everybody is really interested in uh, discussing. So, uh, and this is basically the the discussion between Stavrogin and, and Lisa. And um, I'm just going to pick up, hopefully you'll find 
find the passage, it's not very long. She's saying, so you started counting my mysterious phrases, she laughed. And do you remember how yesterday as I came in, I introduced myself as a dead person? So right away, you get this hint that she is kind of like a doomed person. She considers herself somewhat of a doomed person. She doesn't see a future for herself. She's a dead person. That's how she introduced herself. So, uh, uh, and then he says, no, I don't remember Lisa. Why a dead person? One must live. And you stop short. You quite lost your eloquence. I've lived my hour in the world and enough. So, and that's kind of, you know, why I mentioned that she is somewhat like Kirillov in that sense. She is ready to trade a small time, uh, an hour in the world for a life of sitting and waiting, like she says with that other character, right? She doesn't want to sit and wait. She wants to have that hour and then it's fine. She's at peace, she says. She's at peace for trading her life for this hour. Now, she did mention then later that she was ready to go off with him to Moscow, meaning if you can give me this kind of life that I'm interested in, I'll go off with you. But since you can't, goodbye. Uh, <laughs> that's how I took it anyway. And I'm very curious, like if you think my, you know, I. I, I don't want to put, push my reading on you on your perception of this, but I'm curious to, to hear what you uh, what you think. And do you take it the same way? Do you think she she was already kind of looking for ways to die, maybe, which is why she went to that scene, which was dangerous and fraught with you know me. Uh, um, I, I don't know. That's not how I, I perceived it. Um, I also didn't think that it was a matter. I just thought that she would have gone with him if he could have given her that. You know, no, oh, no, no, that, that was the question for everyone. I, I'm just, ah. but, uh, yeah, I, I want to push it out there because I'm curious to see how different people are viewing this interchange. And also, you know, this is a rare moment where, where the curtain is drawn and we're actually able to see Lisa for who she is. She's not really, we don't get to see much of what, what she's like inside, but this is this moment to see what what is she like? What What, what is her in this whole uh, work, what is her role and her heart and her desires and, and so forth, and compare them to other people because she is unique uh, in a lot of ways. She's, you know, not like Dasha, she's not like Kirill, she's not like anybody. And yet in, there's some obvious interesting parallels. So I'm curious to explore that. Uh, we have Allison, uh, oh, sorry, Madeline, uh, Doug, and then Allison. All right. Well, this uh, isn't quite on your point, but this, because uh, I've put my hand up before, but um, I was looking into uh, what led up to the killing of Lisa Vetta. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think her role in this whole thing basically is to be, be a bit of a flighty maiden. She's sick, then she's faint, then she's on horseback, then she's waving gaily. She loves this man, she loves that man, she's very beautiful. Um, so I was looking at, uh, Dostoevsky really devoted a lot of footage to this fire and really did incredibly amazingly well at describing it. So I just want to read one part of this. Um, some helped to put it out, others gazed like admirers. A big fire at night always produces a stirring and exhilarating impression. Fireworks are based on that. But there the fire is disposed along graceful regular lines and with all its safety produces a playful and light impression as after a glass of champagne. A real fire is another matter. Here horror and some sense of personal danger combined with the well-known exhilarating impression of a fire at night produce in the spectator, not of course in the burnt out inhabitant, a sort of brain concussion and a challenge as it were to his own destructive instincts which alas lie hidden in every soul, even that of the most humble and familiar titular counselor. This gloomy sensation is almost always intoxicating. I really do not know whether it is possible to watch a fire without a certain pleasure. This was said to me word for word by Stepan Trofimovich upon returning from a night fire he had chanced to witness and still under the first impression of the spectacle. Of course, that same admirer of night fires will also rush into the fire to save a burning child or an old woman, but that is an altogether different matter. So 
We have a uh, fire, I believe here is the stand in for a sort of a massive revolutionary fervor, mob mentality, burn it all down, uh, basically the nihilism that we've been seeing in the demons. Right. Um, and people just getting completely caught up in the thrill of it all, the fire, the, the primitiveness of it. And even Stepan Pravimovich, um, is, you know, the, the sort of old guard liberal, he too says, you know, I do see a certain pleasure in it. So the people who uh, descended upon Lisa Vetta, Lisa, anyway, um, who, de who descended upon Lisa and killed her, it, it almost could have been anyone. Anyone who came along at that time, it didn't have to have been her. They were all worked up because of the burning down of things. They were angry about the factories. They were angry about the cholera in the factory. They were angry about so many things. And now the homes were burning and it was night and, you know, let's go. So I think that um, although it was certainly a like a like a plot point for her to be killed in terms of her relationship with Nikolai Stavrogan, I think that he set that up very carefully. So in the context of events, it seemed very natural. Uh, just the way he set it up that um, uh, von Lem that when uh, Stepan Trofimovich went to implore uh, von Lemka for something, uh, von Lemka had just been wildly irritated by something else and kind of brushed him aside. Also by social events. Thank you, thank you, Madeline. Uh, Doug and then uh, Allison. Uh, I was looking at the end of that chapter where um, she is she's killed by the mob, and it's uh, it's almost every sentence is like a beat in a movie. I mean, it, it's like you almost have to reread that very carefully to see what goes on because they arrive and there is. Uh, the crowd's already kind of crazy and it, it's saying there are a lot of noisy drunks and those who were somewhat off their heads to begin with, you know, and they, they talk about this locksmith, the arm waving locksmith, and then there is an arm that hits her, which could be the locksmith or it could be somebody else, but he definitely jumps in. And so I think once she's down and there's sort of quote, blood drawn, then a number of people jump in. And I think that's the demon element, like a fire that just catches fire and goes through a crowd. And nobody remembers, and that wasn't me, and who did that? And, and then the narrator is at his most unfaithful at the end of that chapter, where he sort of says they were arrested and blamed for it, but they claimed they didn't do it, and maybe they didn't, maybe they did, and maybe they didn't. And he actually testifies that it was all by an accident and uh, and then I, I was called to testify, though I was only a distant one. I testified as a witness, though I was only a distant one. I declared that everything happened accidentally and that the culprits were people who, though perhaps bent on killing, actually hardly realized what they were doing. They were drunk and their thinking was already blurred. And that is still my opinion today. You know, it's just sort of weird it has he hasn't rethought it he just says what he said when he testified which seems to be another one of his evasive techniques mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and she falls and she's carried away and she's not dead and maybe not unconscious but then the beginning of the next chapter she's clearly dead uh and so it sort of really jerks you around you think oh she's going to survive no she doesn't but you have don't find that out till the next chapter so it's it's really you almost have to break it down like a movie script and go, there's this action, this word, this action, this action, that action. And it's sliced extremely thin slices of action in those mm -hmm. last paragraphs of that chapter. Yep. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Uh, I want to go back just for a second. Uh, I'll give Allison uh, a chance for you to respond as well. Um, to what Madeline said, I uh, didn't think of it at the moment, but then as Doug started talking about this, um, Madeline brought up this idea of a fire and how it symbolizes revolution. And then we have this crowd that is also uh, has this sort of force that is untamable and not necessarily you know, directed. And I was thinking of uh, Gustave Le Bon, 
uh, and his work on the crowds. And if you've read it, one of the things he says there is the fact that in a crowd, everybody, uh, nobody's responsible for anything because you feel like you're part of this mass. And if you trample somebody in the crowd, it's the crowd that did it, but not any one particular person. And the crowd, this, uh, and therefore, membership in a crowd gives you this absolution from any kind of wrongdoing because, well, I didn't do it. We all did it. And yet nobody did it. You know, you're not going to put a crowd in jail. Uh, and, th and this idea of this crowd mentality and behavior and how things can happen and become very violent, I think that's what makes that passage very believable, that somebody seized on the idea that, look at them, they're here because they want to sneer at us. You know, they already killed us, but now they want to gawk, like uh, Maritza was saying. And, and, and indeed, I think a crowd reacts furiously and instantaneously, and nobody's thinking about anything. Nobody's weighing rational choices here. It's just, it's a knee-jerk reaction, and it is ferocious. And if you've ever been in a crowd situation, uh, you know that is true, and it's very scary, because there's no reasoning. There is no, and that's one thing that Dostoevsky is actually pushing back against, is this idea of, well, we, we should just let people coalesce into these crowds and let them decide in this whole democratization and egalitarianism. He's very suspicious of it. Now, I'm not necessarily agreeing with him, but he has some very good points that should not be taken lightly. Uh, and of course, we know in history how oftentimes crowds can perform awful, awful things. Um, so, yeah. And then and also, I, I want to mention, uh, shout out to Karen for, for saying that narrator is also culpable. I actually, I think that that is exactly right. He is culpable. And in fact, he is, he fits one of the roles that Piotr um, Stepanovich, uh, Peter, uh, mentions as one of the our people. Who are one of the our people? Well, it's the, it's the lawyer that uh, absolves a criminal from his crime because the, the criminal has a particular extenuating circumstance. So, so in, in this sense, the narrator actually fits that criteria exactly, right? He says, well, they're not really culpable because of the circumstances, you know, and, and therefore he falls within that, uh, within that uh, category right away. Uh, Allison, go ahead. Sorry, I uh, <laughs> uh, took some time. Um, I think, you know, this whole idea of um, Liza and why she rejected him. I mean, the thing, the key piece that we're forgetting is at that time, um, most women had, they needed a husband for financial survival. So other than Varvara, who had all her money, generally speaking, um, and, and the thing is, I feel like this character, like what Madeline said is, she was, she was just a young girl. She was flitting from this, this guy at one point, then she had this one. And I feel like she was just flitting around. But I think that was very common where these women were, you know, playing one man against the other because they're trying to get to the man who has the most money. So they're playing a whole little game like that, um, that the men are not aware of because the women are playing this, this you know, flirt with this one and flirt with that one. It's all, you're so special and I'm in love. But really, they're trying to get to the man who has the most money and power because then they had that money and power. Um, so I think that's what she was doing. But I feel like um, the whole scene with the fire and um, it really, it echoes the Scarlet Letter and the stoning of Hester Prynne. And I just looked it up and that book was actually written 20 years before this one. So, um, and I think it is very common that, you know, I, I mean, I think the crowd was at a fever pitch, but they chose her because they were so mad at what um, Nikolai had done. And then they blamed her for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we like to think as a society that we've moved beyond that. But if you look at Hillary Clinton, she was always blamed for what her son did. I mean, not her son, her husband did. And, <laughs> You know, she wasn't the one fooling around with the intern. It was her husband. Right, but right. she got the blame. So we still do this. But I feel like that really traces back to Eve, that Eve brought down the, you know, Adam. Oh goodness, yeah. So no small feet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in our, you know, our psyche on some level. Right. Um, but I also, like, um, really agree with what Madeline said about the fire is symbolic of, uh, and I had actually written in my notes, too, about it, that the fire is symbolic of just destroying the whole society. They're tearing the whole thing down and starting over. And it is so amazing that this was written 45 years before the Russian revolution. So he really 
knew what was coming. So contemporary too, you know, because we're we're going through the same motions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and it really is like you know when you said this was a good time to read this book, I, it it became even more of an interesting time to read this book in a million ways. Um, it's very. For sure. You know. sure. uh, I want to actually build on what you just said. I, uh, if we can go um, back to the holiday for just a second, I know you guys are uh, really mesmerized by uh, Elizabeth and Sarogin, but just for a second, because you, you mentioned this point about society and uh, destabilization of society. In the very beginning there uh, of this section, I think in chapter one, he talks about, um, oops, sorry. Here. Uh, he talks about this uh, notion that in the air there was this something rather more serious than mere thirst for a scandal. There was a general irritation, something unappeasably spiteful. It seemed everyone was terribly sick of something. Some sort of general muddled cynicism had come to reign, a forced as if strained cynicism. And when I read that, I thought, isn't, isn't this the perfect description of what we are experiencing today? This, this sort of muddled, strained cynicism. We're, we're, I think we're tired of being cynical. I mean, we've been cynical for so long uh, of government, of, of uh, politicians, of whatever, whoever you want to be cynical about, just the general sort of state of affairs in the world. Uh, and, 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 but it's, uh, Dostoevsky, he picks up on it. And therefore, there's this general expectation of a scandal general expectation of something, you almost wish for something to break because you're tired of the status quo. And that's when Peter sees his chance. He sees his chance in everybody's waiting for this, so I'm gonna give it to you. You're waiting for a scandal, I'm gonna give you a scandal. And he really you know, capitalizes on his opportunity. So I wanna bring that up as another possible direction for us to talk about. Uh, again, if you want to go back to uh, Elizabeth, that's fine too. But I just thought it was so interesting and so apropos of current events and current um, sort of mindset that it, it, uh, it uh, was worth emphasizing. Uh, Madeline, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm still one thing behind you again. Um, I was thinking about, uh, Karen had been something in the chat about news reports and it made me remember that, uh, you know, Lisa, she did want something besides a good marriage. She had the idea of starting a yearbook of the major events in Russia. And she wanted Shatov to be the printer, which in those days was basically the publisher. And she would, she would fund it, but he would kind of do the writing. So she was, uh, she, you know, she had an ambition in life. And what that made me think of was, um, so those news reports, they wouldn't be the local news. They would be sort of the, the big events. It wouldn't be like binders of newspapers. It would be things that were culled from it all. And at the very end of the passage I read about the fire, uh, Dostoevsky says, but these same people would rush into building on an individual basis to pull out an old woman or a child from a burning building. And uh, so in a sense, um, Lisa, you know, she is that old woman or a child in this, in this moment because he has created a character we care about. She's gotten involved with the psychopath. Um, she feels like, okay, I've lost my, you know, my first flower of youth. Uh, I think it's better if I'm dead, basically, and um, goes out and dies. But, uh, you know, over a century later, enough people are concerned about, about her death that we are sitting here talking about her death uh, of someone who actually didn't even exist. Uh, and that that particularity um, of someone, you know, that individual rescue is so different from what she had envisioned, which was sort of the catalog of big events, a big annual report. And so that dream of hers was also gone, not just of making a good marriage or having uh, Mavriki or Nikolai love her or whatever it was. <clears throat> mm -hmm. No, that, that was a great, that was a great point, Madeline. Uh, yeah, I agree. She, she's a very interesting person, uh, uh, Lisa. 
she has both uh, uh, very attractive traits and also some traits that maybe you know not so admirable. Uh, I'm thinking of how she treats uh, Mavriki, you know, her um, um, a young man, you know, that's a spouse to her almost, or they're almost engaged, I think, uh, or, or are actually engaged, and then she runs off to another man, you know. Uh, so she's very selfish in a lot of ways, but she's also very uh, sincere. And remember that time when she uh, uh, stood before that icon and, and, and took off something, you know, from, from herself, like, and, and gave it to, to as, a, as a donation. Uh, so she's very interesting uh, person. I, I really like how Dostoevsky makes these characters quite lifelike because they're both they have some good, some bad, some some ugly, some beautiful. You know, it's just very dynamic uh, portraits that he he creates, very uh, three dimensional. Uh, Gina, go ahead. Um, she's a she's a liberated woman, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I wanted to go back to what Allison said about um, Dostoevsky. He seems to have. Uh, an innate sense of psychology, and he's really pulling the strings of the reader to, um, you know, to get us to go along with things we wouldn't really want to. And, um, you know, it's more specifically, um, you know, when we first met Stubrogan, you know, we really didn't like him. I mean, what was there to like? He was, you know, although he was young and beautiful, it wasn't enough. He, he was really a bully. And, um, but then like after a while, you know, I and CJ, you know, you know, he's kind of a nice guy, you know, in a way. And then Madeline kind of set us straight, you know, no, he's, a, you know, look at the things he's doing. He's, he's really terrible. And I go, oh yeah, you're right. He is. Um, but they had found with, um, you know, the Me Too movement, part, part of the reason that didn't really work as well as it probably should is that human beings have a bias that when they're told something bad about somebody, they want to, you know, kind of rationalize it. And say, no, he's actually a good person, that we're all good underneath and that, you know, everybody's really a good person. Um, and what happens is that we end up, um, you know, supporting people, you know, like uh, take an example, say somebody tells you that your friend is a rapist you would almost immediately close down and not accept that. So people don't tell you anymore. I mean, it's just, you know, everybody knows you can't, you can't be honest about it. Mm -hmm. And um, it ends up that we allow all this kind of stuff to go on because of that, that it's innate human bias that we have. Now you you top on you know our innate bias toward good looking people and our innate bias toward um, young people, and you know we're allowing all kinds of you know we have a double standard it ends up. So mm -hmm. I think he's 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 pulled us into that, you know, without specifically stating it in a way that you know I really haven't seen in other you know writers. Um, I wanted to talk also about, since I have the floor, yeah, go the ahead. Um, philosophy of political change that I think is expressed in this thing. And that is that in order to get change, you have to have some disruption of the norm. And I think, you know, when you, um, Phil, explained it first, you know, like, you know, the Russian Revolution versus the hippies. But there is a commonality of doing things against the norm. So, you know, to what extent do we need to irritate society to create change? And can that irritation actually, you know, be a tickle? I mean, could it be, uh, you know, a positive irritation that makes our society change? Or, you know, because for the people that would like to see change, we'd like to, you know, figure out how to do it. I hadn't really thought of this idea of, you know, maybe starting a fire or, you know. But um, on the other hand, the one thing that struck me in my entire life as the greatest political action was when the Buddhist monks burnt themselves to stop the war. And so, you know, I do see the, you know, the 
potential of a fire as a political statement is a very strong one to me. Yeah. No, thank you, Gene. That was great. I, I appreciate you bringing up these points. You know, I'm thinking, you know, looking back on the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and the hippies, and what they all had in common that was maybe somewhat different from the American Revolution is the fact that they really, really, really wanted to get something new going. I mean, in the French Revolution, if you remember, they went with a metric system. They got rid of all the old holidays. They tried to change the number of days in a week, which is, you know, something we're so, we, we take for granted. We, could, we take so many things for granted. Same thing with the Russian Revolution. I mean, they really wanted to um, uproot all customs, all traditions uh, in art. You know, the Russian avant-garde of the time was completely out there. Um, with hippies, you know, free love, you know, all the taboos are gone. Very, very uprooting in a sense, very di diversive of the existing system and, and system of um, social relations and, and customs. American Revolution, in a lot of ways, was much more conservative. It did not postulate a change or a break with the, the existing order or customs or traditions. Uh, it really, in fact, built on the it appealed to the existing um, philosophy, right? It, it said we, we we agree that there are you know people have rights and so forth and uh, all of that. So uh, what Dostoevsky describes is this fire that actually is burning up the existing structures, and you know he's very, I think he's good about showing some of the problems with conser conservative outlook of like, let's just keep everything the same, but at the same time he's very very cautious about and, and skeptical about this. Of flirting with new ideas without really understanding where they're going to go, and and the fire is an example of a situation where you flirt with it, but then you can't control it; it gets out of hand, and and it's and, and it's out there, and and that's what he is, I think, mostly um, very skeptical and and antagonistic towards. Uh, I'm going to give uh, Joe one last word, and then uh, what we want to do is go to the breakout rooms for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, where you can share in a little smaller circle uh, some of the thoughts and ideas that you've you've had from both reading and just the general discussion now. Uh, uh, Joe, go ahead. Uh, just jumping in so late here, I don't even know what's been said uh, thus far, but yeah, I would okay. just, yeah. Okay. It, yeah, it's just <laughs> basically uh, the, just, you know, going off of what you've already been discussing this idea, uh, you know, with uh, cynicism and, and this even the approach to change overall um, I, I, I look at this as, as something as different than change. You know, I, I look at change as something as incremental, something that has a vision, something that is addressing an injustice that currently exists in society. Mm -hmm. This is just literally, in this case, let everything burn down. Like, everything needs to go. And I think that there's a huge distinction between that. I mean, now, we can argue as to reasons as to why maybe things, you know, things were at that particular, you know, well, during the Russian Revolution had gotten so bad that, yes, maybe they're more likely to burn everything down because things were, people were struggling so mightily. Um, but uh, th there is this, this um, just going off of what Jeannie had said, even sometimes when I'm reading some things of the, the, uh, that the, the revolutionaries are, are uh, and uh, are writing or saying and and then um uh, i i sympathize with some stuff i mean you know you start to read things about not their approach per se uh but when you start to read something like uh what's more important raphael or petroleum it isn't either or per you know in 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 reality but you do feel sorely that people don't have boots or don't have some basic necessities and things along those lines uh so i think that that's an important thing is that uh, how desperate the people are and i think the other part about it is when there's a distinct there's a really big distinction when you're talking about having a revolution or that is based on the idea of just rec uh, rectifying certain wrongs and injustices and then trying to redo the entire system uh, essentially which right. it, there's a huge distinction between those two and and one has no vision 
one has you know one and it's just pure anger and well, based off the of sentence i want to push i want to push back on that a little bit joe go ahead good good um you, you know uh i've heard the saying if you have a why you can bear any how that's correct um the problem is when you don't have a why and when you have the cynicism you don't have a reason to exist any longer and some people go with lisa and live for an hour and then kill themselves or some people say i'm going to take the world with me as i go right uh and the other thing is this if you look at the current institutions as cancerous and hateful then you will be more reluctant to go for incremental change so it really depends on how you view the system that has come before you if you view it as salvageable incremental change is possible but what's happening i think with in this book is all these institutions are reviled and made uh farcical to the point where uh it's it's viewed as not salvageable at all and what do you do with something is cancerous or not salvageable you just kill it you you, you cut it off uh you don't you don't sell you don't try to fix it from within and that's the um in society i think that's where it becomes dangerous when you start portraying other people or other institutions as demonic and of course you know this is demons right uh when you when you start thinking in terms of pure evil then you opt for uh final solutions if you will right you don't go from half measures uh and you say you know what off with his head <laughs> like that uh and that's that's well, the, it's uh, a combination of ignorance and anger yeah, that actually yeah, yeah. And, and that's and there's a distinction there like you start to say all right the institution never served any purpose tear it down right and right. and that that's that's and that's that's a slightly different thing i i think yeah. that then so i but i agree with you for yeah. to a point but yeah. anyway. all right uh we're gonna go to the breakout rooms uh hopefully you'll enjoy it i'm gonna automatically assign everybody to a room and then maybe visit all of you to make sure you're having a good time there uh, so I will see you there. Let's see. recorded okay welcome back everybody hope you had a productive interesting uh, discussions in your groups your breakout rooms uh so i want to uh quickly revisit one um one subject that we were discussing in, in our breakout room and see if that sparks any any interest so let me read this passage. This is from the speech that Stepan Trofimovich Verkhavinsky gave at this FET. And uh, I'll just read it and talk about it. And I proclaim, Stepan Trofimovich shrieked in the last extremity of passion. And I proclaim that Shakespeare and Raphael are higher than the emancipation of the serfs, higher than nationality, higher than socialism higher than the younger generation, higher than chemistry, higher than almost all mankind, for they are already the fruit, the real fruit of all mankind, and maybe the highest fruit there may ever be, a form of beauty already achieved, without the achievement of which I might not even consent to live, and so forth. Um, so curious if any of you want to comment on this uh, uh, passionate appeal that he makes, uh, and Phil, can you just say, uh, who was it who said that? Uh, this was Stepan Trefimovich Verkhavinsky at the uh, celebration. Uh, at the, festival yeah. That he okay. is, um, you know, he's deriding the revolutionary ideals of focusing on materialism, and, and he makes this appeal why why he thinks it's it's misplaced and, and misguided. So um, any thoughts, anybody want, want to share anything? Let me read as a response from the crowd uh, while you're maybe thinking about uh, uh, your your thoughts on this. And, and there was a 
a seminarist from the crowd that raised his hand and said, Stepan Terfimovich, here in town and in the vicinity, we've now got Fitka the convict, an escaped convict wandering around. He robs people and just recently committed a new murder. Allow me to ask, if you had not sent him to the army 15 years ago to pay off a debt at cards, that is, if you had not quite simply lost him in a card game, tell me, would he have wound up at hard labor? Would he go around putting a knife in people as he does now in a struggle for existence? What have you got to say, Mr. Esthete? So um, the two sides of this social dilemma, beauty versus material reality, what do you guys think? Um, Joe, go ahead. Um, just thinking really quickly about the beauty and material reality. Um, timing is everything in this particular instance. Uh, and I think he's talking to people that really don't want to listen. So it's great that he's, he's saying this. I'm not even saying that it's wrong. Uh, you know, and, and it's, to me, it's, it's, kind of almost a Nietzschean approach, right? Didn't he say like art and beauty are, are the highest forms of, um, of ways of learning and, and, and being? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, and it's in, in that he's saying all these things and it's a respect for, for, uh, for beauty and art, but he's saying it to people that don't want to listen. I mean, that aren't going to listen. So, I mean, at this point, I, I, I don't know. I guess timing's everything. That's just my thought on it. I don't think he's wrong. I just mm -hmm. think he's, uh, you know, not necessarily. I think it's uh, poor timing. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, um, well, the rest of you are thinking also about this. I'll bring up this example I, I mentioned in, in our breakout room. You know, during the, um, well, there were, there were two examples, I guess. One is more recent. Uh, but I'll, I'll bring up the one that I, I was uh, referring to. So during the blockade of Leningrad for about almost three years, you know, during the World War II, people were literally starving uh, from, you know, from hunger, uh, starvation, dying from hunger and starvation. At the same time, they would visit the theater and listen to, or, or the opera rather, and, and, uh, and listen to Shostakovich's uh, performances. And some of them would maybe leave that, leave that opera house and, and, um, and starve the next day. So just the, about timing and um, the role of ideals or some sort of something metaphysical versus physical. You know, I, I, I keep thinking about this Marxist dictum that your being determines consciousness and i i'm not sure i agree but but i'm curious what you guys think uh materialism versus this ideal of beauty that makes life worth living that's what stepan which is really saying is that it's it makes it's what makes life worth living and if and if without shakespeare he would not even maybe consent to live regardless of the the you know what's in his stomach or whatnot uh doug go ahead I, I really get upset with these sort of false dichotomies between beauty and socialism and whatever. I mean, I, I think they, I think life is full of paradoxes. And I, I got to know Antonio Scarmida. I directed one of his plays, uh, which was the basis of Il Postino and then other movies he's done from Chile. Really interesting writer. And he did that play Il Postino about Pablo Neruda. And a lot of the inspiration for it is I think he saw Neruda speaking to some of the poorest miners in Chile about it, one of his political speeches when he was running for president. And these are the poorest miners who maybe had two books in their house. One was a leather bound bomb book, uh, book of uh, the Bible. And the other was a leather bound copy of Neruda's poetry in these very poor houses. Mm -hmm. And some of the people in the family couldn't even read. But when he when he finished his political speech, the crowd started shouting out poems, this poor crowd of miners for him to recite famous mm -hmm. poems of Neruda, which apparently also Pinochet's generals loved a lot of uh, Neruda's love poetry. So poetry really unites cultures in ways that I think 
beauty really unites people. And I think about that, and I think about the museums when I was a kid were free. UC mm -hmm. Berkeley was $25 a semester. And my dad went there free because to the law school because he had the GI Bill. And so that, that, that this idea that beauty is beyond socialism, I, I, I get really impatient with that. So the access to museums is often, even when I was in, in uh, Bratislava before the fall of the Berlin Wall, I was there visiting a set designer and he took me to the churches and he said, yeah, the communists, they take great care of the churches. And it was in beautiful shape. You know, it wasn't like they were trashing the church. It was, I, I, the dichotomies, they're not so simple, you know. No, and, yeah, uh, I agree. I agree, Doug. But, but I, so I don't like Stepan when he does that. No, I know you agree. I mean, I think a lot of people in the group do, but it's like when Stepan does that and then he's accused, like, I care for beauty, but he's essentially a draft dodger, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, any number of people all across this political system. Yeah. No, I, I think what he's responding to, though, is this idea that in the late 1800s, there was this criticism against aristocracy, and together with that, the culture of aristocracy, which all, was all about classical beauty, access to paintings, museums, etc., things that were really out, out of the reach of the proletariat, if you will. Uh, and so uh, in, the revolu in the Russian Revolution, of course, they said, well, we're going to create our own standards of beauty, aesthetics, et cetera, the revolutionary aesthetics, the revolutionary right. morals, et cetera. We're going to dispense with the, with the bourgeois standards of beauty, bourgeois code of morality, and we're going to impose our own revolutionary code of morals. And of course, um, you know, that did not work <laughs> for very long. I mean, by the time you have 1930s, Stalin and his um, circle, they were back appealing to the classical new, or neoclassical style. And the fascists were, were doing the same thing, by the way. In Italy, it was all about neoclassicism. Uh, so it's very interesting how these populist movements, they try to uproot the existing morality and, and code of um, ethics, and then they somehow very curiously come back to the same thing in a different, under a different name, perhaps. Um, so yeah, uh, Allison. And then, uh, yeah. yeah, Allison and then Madeline. Um, right, when we were talking about in our group, my first thought was that, you know, food is far more important than art, even though, you know, as much as I love art, but then um, I was remembering that I just saw something about in Kiev, um, that the orchestra went out into the middle of a town square and all these people came out of their bunkers to go and watch them. And that also reminded me of re when I read um, Margot F Fontaine's autobiography. And <clears throat> she talked about um, during World War II, when um, the Germans were bombing London, um, there was one time when the, the air raid sirens went off in the middle of a ballet performance and the Royal Ballet kept performing. Um, and everybody just pulled their gas masks out, put them on and, and kept going. Mm -hmm. um, and then what it also reminded me is that um, I, Royal Ballet as well as a bunch of other, many dance companies, um, they do something called Royal Ballet Day where they film company class and their rehearsals. And um, the one uh, for 2021, so I've been dancing to them in my kitchen. I, I did when everything shut down. Um, and the one for 2021, they're on the stage of Covent Garden with their masks on. And I thought when I watched it, that that would probably the last time somebody had to wear a mask in Covent Garden was during World War II when the Germans were bombing. So clearly in all of these cases, all these horrific things are going on, but people still needed art. So uh, there you have it. Uh, I, you know, I, I just can't help but think what's going on right now with average Russians, with what's going on in, uh, you know, it just does make me think. Um, Oh, no. Sorry about that. That's All right, no, no worries, no worries. Uh, let's see, uh, who was it? Madeline, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks for reading that uh, quotation, Phil. Sure. Uh, because it was, there are almost uh, three points of view going on here. Uh, because remember, um, Stepan Trofimovich 
is not really a creator. He's an appreciator of the arts. And as an appreciator of the arts, you know, his, his, his rebutter, uh, if that's a word, uh, rebuttaler, um, <laughs> his, re his rebuttaler um, uh, pointed out, he said to him, you, you, you basically traded, you, you sold a human being at a game of cards. And I, it made me think, Phil, of what you had been saying uh, at some point in one of these earlier uh, sessions of this, of this book, that the peasants were attached to the land. So let's say that you up and sold your land and moved to another part of Russia. You might take your, some of your household servants with you, but your peasants did not come with you. The peasants were part of the land. So it wasn't just that, I mean, just, uh, but that he was uh, gambling away another human being, but that he was uprooting Fetka. So Fetka went into the military and then whatever happened after that, he became a convict in Siberia. Yep. So he, 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 he ruined his life and so the guy is saying, look, you think art is so wonderful, but you are a member of the, you know, the art appreciating class is so dissolute and so, um, so careless with other people's lives in a way. And uh, Stepan, you know, he, he's not one of the creators. He's really not even, you know, a minor, I mean, he's not even like just say a Salieri just for, cultural comparison purposes, although Salieri <laughs> was not terrible. No, um, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, but he, he's not even that. And mm -hmm. yet um, it, it would make more, it would come, it would have more credibility if it came from, uh, I think it's the guy who Phil said is the Turgenev stand-in, the old writer. Um, Karmazinov. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would have might have more credibility saying that art is more important than than food. Yeah, no, uh, for sure, for sure. And the fact that Dostoevsky makes that point, that's why I really appreciate him, because even though Dostoevsky himself is a con obviously a conservative person, a conservative, you know, he is on the side of status quo and not really on the side of the revolutions. And at the same time, he exposes some of the hypocrisy of these old guards like Stepan Trofimovich, and you know, he he didn't have to include that little episode in there, but he did to make it to make a point that a lot of them really, uh, you know, with all their idealistic posturing, they really uh, did not act it out in in their lives. And and just to be clear, when you when you uh, sent your serf to uh, to be a conscript in, in in the army, that was a death sentence. They never came back. Uh, so that was essentially a, a, a way for you to get money from the state because the state would pay you a certain amount for um, essentially donating some of your servants to the arm, to the military, uh, and but they would never come back. And that's why, of course, Fetka ran off and was in, uh, and then was jailed and sent to hard labor because he probably knew very well or learned very quickly that maybe in the Crimean campaign or whatever it was that. It was a death sentence. I mean, they were literally, literally uh, cannon fodder uh, in, in the army there. So yeah, absolutely. Point taken there, uh, Madeline. About, uh, oh, um, it's also interesting that um, in, this, in this part, it's something that, um, that Stepan had mentioned much earlier, but in this he appears, he's wearing a pair of um, Hussar boots, which were what were worn but they were worn by, I believe they were worn by the cavalry. Um, I don't think they were worn, they're not walking boots. I think they're riding boots and they're very glamorous looking, mm. but um, they're not meant for walking. And so he's actually sort of imitating um, the, the heroes of the war while not, mm. while kind of ignoring the consequences of what's happened to Fetka. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, uh, Maritza, go ahead. I think it's interesting the, um, the way Stefan was received when he made that speech, and then the way that the maniac who jumped up on stage immediately after him was received. <laughs> the crowd was cheering for him, and they were not impressed with Stefan. Um, but it's 
kind of interesting the almost like they were unwilling to hear Stephen, but may, and maybe it's because in their mind they viewed him because you know the one the student told him you know you have the luxury of saying this, Mister Step, because you know you you live in the realm of having the luxury to just walk around and admiring beautiful things. Mm. Um, the rest of us do not. Um, so I just thought it was interesting that they were so enamored with the uh, the maniac talking about. Um, you know, he was saying, this is none of your aesthetics. This is real. Um, right, right. He was taking the opposite view of like, yes. railroads, hey, right. Right. Hey, hey, right. And I think <laughs> that's an interesting um, spotlight mm-hmm. being placed on the, the society, the populace. Because, you know, we already identified that this um, FET is a mixing of many different social classes. So this is kind of like, this is society with all its good, bad, and ugly, as it were. Mm-hmm. And here they stand rejecting, uh, rejecting the, yeah. the concept of, yeah, of beauty as a necessity. And yeah, wanting I, to... I see Stepan Trofimovic as a sort of pivotal person in this whole uh, work because it starts with him. And in some ways it, it kind of finishes with him. He, while he's not the active, most active uh, character in, in the novel, he, in terms of ideas, in terms of philosophy, in terms of influence, he is really pivotal and he's, to me, he almost symbolizes like a lost generation of intelligentsia that was not able to really uh, affect any positive change for, for, for the people and it ended up, and, and, and in some ways, I mean, Dostoevsky didn't know this of course, but he kind of foresaw that there was gonna be a very bloody upheaval, but in some ways the blame could be laid at their feet that they did not do more to prevent this bloody massacre and of course you know you realize what happened uh the peasants um just like you know you guys are aghast at, at lisa's death but p- please realize that when the real revolution happened there were hundreds and thousands of lisas that were killed and raped and just i mean it, it was so much beyond the de- the demons were unleashed way beyond even what the Seska could have predicted but of course when he wrote this the time was so, it was still relatively quiet and peaceful and controlled and the state police worked pretty well in, in Russia at the time. So all these things were kind of quelled at the initial stage, but he could not have foreseen the horror of what went unleashed later. Um, yeah. Anyone else wants to discuss or, or ask any questions about the reading or share your thoughts, please do so. We are almost at, at, at the end of our time here. So I just want to maybe uh, give the last chance to anybody to share and then maybe concluding thoughts. Anybody has any concluding thoughts? Oh, Jeannie, go ahead. I have a question, Phil, mm-hmm. uh, that I had thought of. I couldn't figure it out. Um, did Peter have some kind of glorious uh, end in sight of, of his revolution? I mean, was there something that he was hoping for? That was good. I think I think the key to that is his conversation with Starogin in the previous section that we read, where he says, I am a scoundrel. I really am a scoundrel. I'm not a revolution, I'm not a socialist, I'm a scoundrel. So he sounds like to me he is doing what Stavrogin is doing, um, but in a different way. Stavrogin, in some ways, is this experimenter of human nature. He's trying to see how far he can push the envelope and how far he can transcend and be this ubermensch you know the nietzschean superman uh and he is willing to trample over people's lives and customs and just about anything peter is kind of the same way but he i think he likes to be the great schemer and the great um this sort of dark uh gray cardinal if you will you know the 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 horse that no one is betting on but but the one that actually comes comes out uh, as the victor in the end. In some ways, he, he, uh, I think of Stalin when I think of, of Peter, because Stalin was not prominent in, until the very end that he came to power. He was actually, like a lot of people did not like him, didn't think he was had a lot of power. And yet he was scheming and making alliances with people. And that's what Peter does throughout this whole work. He is scheming with this person. He is misinforming that person. He's prov- provoking this other group of people, he's playing one off of the other, you know, with uh, uh, Stavr- uh, with uh, his father and 
Varvara Petrovna, you know, I mean, that was genius how he made them, made a rift uh, between them. I mean, that was diabolical, right? The way he, he read the letters of the one to the other. I mean, it was just masterful, kind of Ma Machiavellian type of uh, manipulation. And, uh, but the end game for him, I think he just enjoys this. Like, I, I think of him, I, I think of a joker. Some people just like to watch the world burn. That's that's uh, that's that nihilism. He hates the status quo, but he doesn't. I don't think he has an end game. I don't think he has an ideal in the sense. I think he's like a demon that likes the destruction. He enjoys enjoys seeing people kind of squirm and you know reveal their bad you know weaknesses and things like that. I don't know if I'm I, again. That's obviously obviously that's just my take on it. I, I'm very curious what what any of you have to. Uh, say on this as well. I, I don't think actually there's one interpretation to be honest. I, I think this is such a work where you really cannot say one way or another uh, because there's too many possibilities, too many alternative interpretations in a, in a complex work like this. Uh, CJ, go ahead. Yeah, I would underline that and just that I think it's a hatchet job in a lot of ways for writers he doesn't like, but it goes way beyond that. It's like, it's so subtle and complex. Mm -hmm. like... Go ahead, yeah. CJ. Yeah, I think in that passage you were referring to, Phil, that Peter suggests he's sort of just interested in getting the reins of leadership. You know, it's a power grab. I, I don't... And yet his scheming is so vacuous. You know, it's not even good scheming. It's just... <laughs> it's not good scheming. It's bad scheming. It's just paranoia. <laughs> bad things happen. <laughs> you know, he's not, he's not as good as Putin. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> Different scale, right? Different scale. All right. Uh, unless there are any other comments or last. Maritza. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just uh, uh, wanted to comment on Maritza CJ's Maritza. comment. Um, go ahead. Uh, I, I didn't get the feeling that it was about a power grasp for um, Peter. I think it was an elitist um, delusion. I think that he perceived himself to be above all men. And as such, he was the one who had to put all these wheels into play. And so he wanted to be the puppet master, as it were. And the reason that he seems all over the place is because, I mean, he's a little demented in his idea of elitism. Like, that's what I viewed of him. That, And I also viewed it as almost a tongue-in-cheek um, character that what we are presented with because he is the evil which he is seeking to banish. And, and I thought that's kind of interesting because that's kind of the way it looks. It's like, you know, the, all, all the speeches and the, the power plays that people are talking about for the, the elites versus the, the common and this, that, and the other thing, that's him. I mean, even mm -hmm. when he says his big speech about how you have to make all these changes, except for, you know, those 100 men who have to be above it all because they have to be the ones to tell all, every, to make sure everyone else is doing everything exactly the same. So I, I think yeah, his anti, was anti-elitism, except for the elite that he's part of. <laughs> right. And so I, I, I feel like he was a little bit of a tongue in cheek character yeah. for um, Dostoyevsky because he's he is the evil that right. he's trying to banish, as it were. Yeah, no, for sure. What's interesting to me, though, is the fact that he looks up to or at least seems to look up to Stavrogin as this uh, uh, character that could actually be the front man for this whole thing. In other words, he really thinks that Rogan is something. It, 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 he admires him for. So he, I think that's again maybe because the only genuine, genuine uh, feeling that we receive of him. Maybe, maybe even that is not genuine. I think that's a little bit again the um, you know we're we're spoon fed um, Dostoevsky's views on religion, and he's trying also in a indirect way to tell us that you know to be a nihilist is bad as it were. So I think that that's another thing like this delusional character, Pyotr Stefanovich, he's looking up to whom he believes to be like the ultimate Ubermensch, as it were. And that's, I think that that's kind of the, the view that I'm seeing from there. 
Yeah, that's great. Madeline, go ahead. Uh, two things. The first is, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if I asked this at a, at a previous meeting. Uh, a couple of times they mentioned, um, they made a reference to three men and a half who are doing something somewhere or making a decision somewhere. I didn't know if that was a reference to a specific political thing of the time or whether it's some sort of Russian proverb or if it was just some random thing that the author made up. Uh, which one? Is that it was a reference to something about um, just a couple of times of, oh, you know, it's just three men and a half who are making the decisions about something or other. Sort of implying that uh, the peop that it's a small number of people in power, but it was this oddly specific number <laughs> each time. Yeah, I think uh, Karen just uh, made a note about that. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember the exactly th that exact passage, uh, but yeah, that probably probably is right. And the um, other thing, I just wanted to say thank you, Phil, Doug, and CJ. This is really great. It's like going to a seminar every two weeks. It's fantastic. <laughs> Awesome, great, I'm glad everybody's enjoying. Okay, well, it's uh, 17 after, so I guess um, probably- So I, I, I found this passage where Peter tells Stavrogan. Um, do, do we have time for me yeah, to read go this? Yeah, we'll go as, as, as long as everyone- This, this is from chapter eight of the previous section. Um, and it's the passage that led me to infer that Peter's interested in a power grab. Um, picking up in the middle, Peter says, the main point is that a new authority is coming, and that's just what they'll be longing and crying for. What use can we have for socialism? It destroys the old authority without replacing it. But we will have authority authorities such as the world has never before heard of. All we'll need then will be a lever to lift the earth. And since we have it, we'll lift it. And I think he's referring to Stavrogan there as his lever. And th that was my reading. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I actually was thinking of the cult of personality uh, when he was talking about this, you know, because this is a phenomenon that really became came to its own in the 20th century with you know Stalin Hitler uh, Mao you know with with the media becoming what it is and I don't know if this was was thinking about that at all probably not but this I but they were thinking about the idea of this front man this image of a person who is almost like an idol right replacing God in people's minds and Stavrogin was that kind of a idol right he was well educated well bred if you will uh, kind of good looking. So basically fits the bill, right? As the, as the person, I mean, think of like, you know, which is why, by the way, I'm thinking of like Reagan, you know, an actor becoming a president. It's, it's all about aesthetics. It's all about the image, right? You want to, you want him to check off all the right boxes and have this sort of charisma, right? That, that, that allows you to to do things that you would not normally consent to doing if you have this type of charismatic uh, person in the front. So, yeah, that's, um, I mean, the genius of Dostoevsky, right, in predicting so many aspects of, of 20th century uh, horrors is really something. I mean, it was really prescient. I, I keep coming back to that. It's just something else. So, a, a few paragraphs later, Peter adds, and we'll be the only ones to build it, us and no one else. And Stavrogan says sheer insanity. <laughs> um, so it, it's, I don't know. Um, that's just the way I read it. You know, it's very open-ended. It's like, you know, you can take it almost any, any there are lots of ways you can take it and what, what's going on in their, in their minds as they're going back and forth like that. Doug, do you have any final thoughts for us? I just only have one, this uh, this idea of God and replacing God, which Kieran just made a note on. And there's that one speech, and I can't remember exactly the character, it'll come to me, but he's talked, it's that whole theory that a certain people have to, certain percentage of people have to die to change the world. And that seems to be almost a scientific mathematical idea, but is actually highly mystical, kind of, like some percentage of death will lead to transformation, almost like it's 
going back to human sacrifice in a very primal way as a cure to the problem. It's very, it's amazing the directions this book goes into that anticipates anthropological literature in some ways. Right. And it's, uh, but that to me is how they're desperately searching for the answer. Uh, and we're still searching in as much the same way, making the same mistakes and doing similar things. For sure, for sure. Well, thank you everybody for a very uh, interesting spirited discussion. I, as always, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, hopefully you did too. Uh, and we will see you in two weeks. We'll be finishing up the, the book and then we'll have a, a, a separate meeting to look back on the entire thing and just compare notes and see what we've learned. And hopefully you will enjoy that as well. Okay, thanks everyone thank for joining us. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Phil. All right, we'll uh, see you. See thanks, you later. Bye.